Hey folks, this is Shane Getson here, MLA Laxon in Parkland. Um, recently I passed a motion 501 and for a private member to uh, literally win this to be the first uh, member out of the session, of this session here to uh, have a motion passed is actually a pretty big accomplishment. So I'm really happy about that. Now the really real reason why I'm really happy about this is I'm talking about transportation and trade utility corridors. So the concept behind that isn't just a train set, it isn't just a pipeline, it isn't just a fiber optic line or maybe a hydroelectric line or literally connecting trade uh, between areas. It's the whole concept. So right now what we have with all the, uh, the blockade events that are taking place, we have a lot of the strife, a lot of the consultation issues are because we're doing literally snowflake projects. So when we go out and apply for a project, you do all the consultation, private industry typically goes through that on their side, they make all the applications, regulation, etc. They talk to the First Nations folks, which there isn't really, there's some good uh, structure in place to have those consultations, but whether it's meaningful or unmeaningful, there's still some gray areas. And that's what we end up seeing is these relationships get unfortunately wedged and they become wedge issues. And unfortunately what we're seeing is a lot of folks are using uh, that to their advantage to try to lock in our economy. So the reason why I'm excited about this, if we did a trade utility corridor, a transportation trade utility corridor, what we do is we deal with all of that ourselves. We as government aren't going to spend a ton of dollars on this. We're not literally lending loans or doing backups or anything else for industry. We're literally doing what government can do on our side of the fence. So conceptually, we would look at where this corridor should go. It would go from an area where we have resources and where we need to get to uh, to get our resources to market. And when I'm talking resources, it's not just energy, it's not just oil, it's not just gas. The resources that we have in our province at our disposal, uh, people would die for. People fought wars over the resources we have. We have all of the agriculture, we have all of the forestry, we have all of the, the natural energy resources, we have mining, we have so much at our disposal and the issue and the challenges that we have is we can't get that to market. So back to the corridor. The corridor what we do is we pick a swath of land and we navigate that through our different partners. Partners being the Northwest Territories, partners being the Yukon and yes partners being our international trading partners, Alaska, the US itself. So if we were to untap this corridor, if we were to take that initiative in the next two years of our time to make sure the consultations take place with the First Nations folks that are in the immediate areas, to make sure that they have shared benefit of that corridor. So whether it's an ownership model, whether it's a, a linear assessment model, we can work that out, we can work those deals out. And if working with our territorial partners, we make that alignment on their side of, of where they would like this corridor to go, it would tap into their resources as well. So as potential in the Northwest Territories, it could unlock again the Mackenzie Valley Delta, which again, the last iteration of that was a First Nations led pipeline that was going to go from Mackenzie Valley Delta down to Zama, which was 1700 kilometers. The route that is conceptually sitting there right now that has the most traction would reduce that down to about 700 kilometers. That project could become viable and that project could give the First Nations communities in that area an untapped sustainable income for generations to come. If we're looking at uh, the area near the Yukon, there currently is a gateway to resources project that's out there and it's the federal government that has a billion dollars on the table. The Yukon Territory has about another billion dollars on the table and industry has about a billion on the table. So there comes in the milking stool concept. You have three legs of funding to try to get literally roads built so they can access the resources. If we were to align our trade utility corridor along that route, we would do that by default. We would give them access to trains. We would give them access to roads. We would literally give them the infrastructure so they could continue to build. Now on the Alaskan side of it, what we're looking for is deep sea access. It wasn't about getting to tidewater because just because it happens to be salt water does not make it uh, viable for us. When we're looking at international markets, if I'm going to bring a ship into the Tawasin terminal, I can maybe get 80,000 barrel unit tanks or, or ships out there for, for tankage. Arguably pretty small. When you want to start going internationally and going across the big ocean, not just skimming down the coast to get into Seattle or to California or into Texas, it, it doesn't uh, make lend itself to be profitable. You're simply spending too much to get the commodity type there that doesn't give you the net res resource on the other end. But if we were to tap into those three deep sea ports, so Niski, Valdez, and Anchorage, out of those ports we could get two million barrel tankers coming out of there. 
So conceptually, you can get the big, big super tankers and also the big, big seat containers. Now, why am I talking seat containers? Again, not fixating on one product or commodity type. We could literally be taking manufactured foodstuffs. We could be taking agricultural equipment. We could be taking our stuff, our technology, not just our resources, but finished value added products over to Asia. So if I were, hypothetically speaking, moving a million barrels a day of the heaviest heavy bitumen that we have, compressed in a puck, so utilizing the same concept as can a puck, but potentially loading up sea containers, the train would be heading that way, which would be taking off um, literally the stresses that we have in our current pipelines for commodities to, to move it uh, on that side. Because again, the heaviest of the heavy bitumens cost us the most to move it because of its it's dense and we need to liquefy it, we need to cut it with other um, uh, products that actually cost us money to move it. So if we were to densify this, the benefit of that is if there's ever a spill, if there's ever a derailment, you don't have an oil spill, you simply have a cleanup action of throwing these pucks that are encapsulated in a polymer back under the cars. So it negates any of the environmental issues. And if we're using conventional sea cans to move this material, well then all the offloading facilities are already there. So we simply grab onto the sea can, put it onto the dock, which then gets loaded onto a sea container ship. Now, the really neat thing is that folks often, when you think about a map, we're laying it flat, but obviously we know the world is round. With the proximity of Alaska itself to Japan or China, those shipping routes, literally the distance that those ships have to move, are two to five days shorter. So you're moving a bigger ship with more commodities and you're burning less fossil fuels upwards to half of a week to three quarters of a week. Now the duration in a year, obviously you can see that that's reduced. You would reduce the amount of time that ship would have to spend on the ocean nearly a month in duration back and forth. So now, conceptually we have a million barrels of oil moving in compressed bitumen uh, puck form that if there was ever an event of uh, derailment that wouldn't have a spill conventionally that we're seeing with the other commodities moving. It's going onto a sea container. Now on the back end, we're bringing those ships back. So all the stuff that we buy back from Asia, we would be bringing that back along the same trade utility corridor. So now your one train is going this way, the other one's going back the next. Arguably, we would only type those ports for three days moving our product. The remaining four days of the week, it's completely open for other commodity types. We could be moving petrochemical products from the sturgeon refineries up along that road. We could be moving our foodstuffs, of which China wants our food. They want the final finished value product, not just the raw commodities anymore. And we can be bringing cartage in. Now, the interesting part with the way the shipping routes work now is that there is a backlog. So between Seattle and Tawasson, there's a backlog of offloading all of these big ships and arguably some of the bigger ships that can't make it. But on that end, up in the Alaska side and through Alberta, and potentially in the north end of Edmonton, we would be able to uncouple that. So where they really want to get those finished commodities are down to the major population. So south of the border, into the Midwest and the Eastern Seaboard. When you simply look at logistics of unloading and moving those, those cars and moving that commodity, you're getting to that market arguably up to 10 days quicker. 10 days quicker of getting someone's finished manufactured products, it's huge. It, it uncouples tons of things for us. Now, if, again, the trade utility corridor concept, we have an, uh, a free trade zone that sits around the major uh, areas, the, the capital region being Edmonton, for an example. It's under uh, um, uh, the USMC, or it was the free trade agreement initially. What it does is it ties in rail transport, roads, and airports. So if we were to put this inland terminal in place, we could literally bring that cartridge, knock it off into its other final destination ports or a manufacturing component and make it into its final product. We could do all of that here. So think of a big offloading terminal that could literally give Asia 10 day quicker access to their big market and their customers. These are the things, when we're talking the Alberta Advantage, when we're talking about getting the economy rolling again, these are the type of things that we're talking about. So if folks can stick with us, start thinking big. These are the things that we can do together. Not get fixated on the minutia, not have these wedge issues when we're talking about um, First Nations folks against us or we're ramming things through. That is not it at all. So don't get distracted by it. We're working on the big picture items and we literally want to unlock this. We want to make Western Canada and the Northwest Canada thrive. We can do this together and look forward to any conversations that you might have, any questions, comments or concerns. 
please get in touch with me. I would love to come to your town hall. I would love to sit across the coffee table with you and lay out this plan. We're, we're working on the bigger picture. We're going to be back in business. We've got to think big and we've got to think of the next few generations, not to keep squabbling over the individual projects. So thank you for your time and look forward to hearing from you.